So here it is, the real story of Earth as I've been told. This planet was not the result of a big bang or the creation of God as you understand God from the teachings we've been taught. This planet was seeded with life by race of benevolent aliens from a planet called Dida. It's located in the Centauri star system. And when I say life, I mean all of it, especially us. This race of beings are immortal and for millions of years they developed tall that has ever lived on this planet. It was their seed bank, lovingly referred to as the Garden of Eden, the most beautiful of all planets, by far as Earth. These beings were given the responsibility of populating vast assortment of planets in many places with plant and animal life. It was their job to create, to seed life. Unlike the story we were told, God does not work alone. As you see, we have angels speaking for all of you. And for the record, the entirety of the universe refers to Creator God as the One. And Creator is a fitting assertion. The One is neither alive or dead, male or female, good nor bad. Creator just is. Creator is life, all life. The One is responsible for creating all the framework which functions to provide an environment for everything to exist in. Creator created this planet, and all planets you will ever visit. The One was most impressed by the intelligent creatures that function to serve the universe Creator created. The Immortals. They are benevolent in nature and guided by love. The craftsmen tasked with maintaining the integrity of what the One had created. Each variety is responsible for its own set of initiatives bestowed upon them. Some maintained light, some sound, some created lesser beings to inhabit the planets our creators from Eden seeded with life from their amazing garden, and so on. However, in the face of all the One had created, even Creator was not perfect. The One had made only one mistake, but it was a big one. I'm not going to even pretend I understand it. But in the beginning, when the One was all there was, Creator became lonely. To combat this problem, the One divided itself by 25% to create another, lesser version of itself. This new number two quickly realized that's exactly what it was. Lesser. The One could have split in half and made them equal, but Creator didn't. And when the One finished what Creator had set out to do, create the universe, Number two took confidence to the fact Creator played no role whatsoever in all that was created. Upon realizing the sole purpose of number two's existence was to keep the one from becoming lonely again, Creator decided to leave. Number two fell from grace and rejected Creator's place at the side of Creator's Creator and left. At the time, number two didn't realize it, but its choice to leave introduce something new to the universe. Two things actually, conflict and free will. Number two took up residence in a far off corner of the universe. It didn't take long to realize though, Creator was all alone just as well. As the one had divided itself to solve the same problem, so too did number two. But number two didn't want to face the same dilemma. So Creator divided into six equal individuals. And they quickly set out to develop this corner of the universe into their very own version of what the rest of the universe was like. However, the division into six individuals had corrupted the very nature of what that being had been in the first place. And the result was a galactic society of miscreants. Elites who care ninth division had separated more than just number two. It deleted key bits of knowledge and understanding from the consciousness of the whole universal subconscious. So when these six rejects seeded their own little corner in the universe, they didn't even realize or understand. All the creatures they created to reside on the planets had no soul intact. They were flesh and blood beings who only lived for a certain length of time and would die one day. We were created from the one pure just the way we were, with a soul, for our reason for a grand God created conscious reason. 
It was the intention of our creators for us to be the caretakers and guardians of the Garden of Eden. So this is where the soul was educated and prepared for our role in the afterlife of seeding planets. For us, that was our role after our time expired on Earth. Here we learn the needs of all the plants, animals, insects, and aquamarine life involved with our work. The knowledge was retained by the soul, and upon its arrival back on Eden, could begin working in the field of planet seeding almost immediately was the chore of all beings. When our creators made humans, we were made as two halves of a whole. One side of you in the subconscious would exist back home, and the other consciousness is here on Earth. It was a way to never forget home and in times of struggle, a voice of reason to offer advice once self-aware love happened. To you, my friend, so no matter what, you're never alone, like the one had once been. That voice in your head, your conscience, is actually your other half and until the two halves are reunited, each functions as its own separate entity in favor of you. However, they share the telepathic link to each other directly connected by loving. If you sway from love, you lose the connection. Of course, here in our day, they raised us to believe thinking anything other than it's your own voice that would get you locked up in a psych war. Big threats to protect big secrets. Anyways, the educating of human souls and the evolution of the Garden of Eden went on with great success for hundreds of thousands of years. In fact, it was so successful humans were spread throughout the universe to populate the planets that had been seeded into conscious life. But then everything changed. By the way, I told you which star system Eden is in without feeling like I'm giving up a secret because there are people here on Earth searching for it. And they already know. The Kepler telescope made a discovery this year, not six months ago. There is one particular planet quite close to Earth, like close enough where the technology here will allow our probe to make it there in a relatively short time. It's not Eden, but it's one step closer. They need to be stopped. I've tried more than once to stop them, and I've held the lives of humanity in my hands before. Since then things have changed, I'll get to what happened. The process of getting home is entirely different. In the past, upon death, our soul immediately ascended back to Eden. It's no longer the case though. Now there are conditions, lessons that must be learned. You must become worthy of immortality first, you must be pure. The good news is, your soul is sent back to earth as many times as it takes to get it right. How could I relay the same info as David or Lennon and never met either? Nobody has ever given up on. Leave no man behind is a God statement. Leave nobody, not even the most vile of human beings. We all eventually come to reason and get it right. This is why we should be helping each other. One day you will spend eternity with every single human here. Unless we fall victim to the trap the elite have set in place. The system that captures your divine light. What that trap is will blow your mind. However, we aren't there yet. There's still more to understand first. Since the last attempt to stop these elite madmen, which is what brought the burning and torture of a group called the Knights Templar, nobody has dared to try and stop them again. And they have taken full advantage of this to secure their stranglehold on planet Earth. The Knights knew what I know, and they were about to tell. Once you know why, and what is at stake, You'll understand why I've made it my choice to confront these men, in these lives, and take back our freedom. And we need to take that freedom not only from the hands of the elite tyrants who control us through money, but from the ones who destroy some of us by taking our souls. I'm talking about the church. You all know which one. They are the real influence behind these madmen running the world. There is none more powerful than the one we are all thinking about. The guy with the funny hat. None human anyways. Yeah, I just said that. But it's gotta be said. And someone had to say it. 
and that's always been my role, to sound the alarm. But this time, the call will be heard. This time, the world is ready to hear it. With my voice David's and many, the age of information has brought a new dimension, one we have never had available before. This time we have the ability to unite us all worldwide. And we are, and the souls of all the warriors who have ever lived and died at the hands of the elite are here helping, all of them. You're all here. Some will know it, most don't, but you all will. The universe will not let you sleep until you accept the responsibility of fixing what we have always allowed them to do to us. The elite aren't exactly like us in case you haven't noticed. There is an empty void, a hole in all of them. It really is us versus them. You may believe we are all one and some spiritual awakening is on the horizon. But please, know this. There are two humanoid species living together here on Earth. And no, they are not shape-shifting reptilians. In all ways they are identical to us, except for one thing. They don't have a soul, no spirit light. When they die, they are dead. That's it. No more. They are manufactured clones. Well, that's not true. There's one other thing that separates us from them. They will not, under any circumstances, wake up to see the world as we do, ever. These soulless shells I'm talking about are the elite, and they know what they are about and what they will never stop doing. There are others too who suffer an impairment of their soul and they have no idea what they are, but I'll get to that later. It's imperative if we want to experience any kind of freedom again. We begin working together as one well-oiled machine. It's the only way we can move forward into a new age of enlightenment, free from all the pain that you've accepted as your life on planet Earth. But it will not be easy. Look deep down inside yourself, that calling you've always felt inside you but could never quite figure out. It is our home. It's Eden calling to us all, and your other half reaching for you. And they need you now, more than ever. I'm here on a mission with David and many. I'm here with them to wake you up to what you used to be, to what you are now and what we all need to do, to what you need to be. If we ever want to be freed from the nightmare we've been tricked into surrendering our lives to, I guess strict isn't the best choice of words. They didn't trick us. They genetically modified us is what they did over time. And that's the least of it. What I'm about to tell you now is where things get intense. What you think you know about the history of Earth and its many different inhabitants are all lies. And it's the job of the church to protect those lies. And the reward of protecting those lies goes to the enforcers of the lie, the Illuminati. That reward is your life of servitude. And every man, woman, and child belongs to them because the elite know they are soulless shells of what we are. They hate us for having souls. Once I explain what they are lying about and how far they've gone to protect the lie, you'll understand just how much hate for us they hold. The only other things that interest them are material riches and the thrill of feeling somehow superior as they treat us like garbage in our ruthless pursuit of the almighty dollar and we allow it because deep down we feel like our souls will live on regardless. But that was the old way. All I can say is we were lucky that our creators had made it so only two humans that reproduced would have a child with one pure soul. So, just as everything was going completely as planned with the Garden of Eden, shit happened. There was an invasion on Eden and they lost. They are peaceful scientists not warriors. The Anunnaki, a race of soulless beings from the corner of the universe developed by what had once been number two, had come seeking knowledge. They required technology to save the atmosphere of the planet they came from, Nibiru. But Eden refused to help them. They were not in the business of cooperating with any of the soulless abominations created by the six-headed beast which had manifested from the peace of the one, Creator had given up to address its loneliness. 
and the Anunnaki replied in fours. In the process of taking what they came for, they also discovered the location of Earth. They left Eden in near ruins, and made off with some very sensitive, essential information about all life, and about planet Earth in particular. The Anunnaki first arrived on planet Earth during a cleansing period around 300,000 years ago. Once all of the different species were properly sampled and classified, or if circumstances required it, the scientists in charge would initiate a cleansing, the eradication of the old, to usher in the new. The idea being to repeat the same process with new varieties of plants and animals, as they were developed and created. As I said, the human being is one half of a whole. On Eden, our other half works to create all the plant and animal life that is taken to Earth for mass production. The one had provided a master set of a select number of plants and animals. These scientists then used the endless possibility of combinations to genetically combine these master life forms into everything living we've ever seen here on Earth. The half that was involved with the genetic creation of a specific plant or animal on Eden worked telepathically with its other human half as it nurtured and developed that individual life form here on Earth. One half births the species, the other half raises it. This particular ice age was also to repair a structural issue with the drainage system. A series of massive trenches and gullies were needed and the only thing powerful enough to dig them were migrating glaciers. The humans all relocated to Africa during that time, moved by ships sent from Eden. Unfortunately, this relocation turned out to be the very thing that gave full advantage to the Anunnaki. The Anunnaki were quite pleased with initial test samples they took upon arrival. This planet was rich with monodomic gold just as the stolen information from Eden had stated. The information from Eden provided them with the formula used to create or repair an atmosphere. Monodomic gold is the key ingredient and they needed a lot. The first thing the Anunnaki did was set in motion a chain of events which accelerated the melting process. There was a large area though where life was thriving, and the climate was fairly stable. Here the Anunnaki found a creature they hoped could be used as workers for the massive job of mining the earth. Humans. However, these creatures were quite different than anything the Anunnaki had ever encountered. They seemed intelligent enough, but they were impossible to deal with. Nothing, not fear, not pain, not even watching their friends die would sway them to what the Anunnaki wanted them to do. It was almost like they had one purpose and couldn't do anything else even if they wanted. But what it really was, was love for their home and an outright refusal to damage, destroy, alter, or manipulate the earth at the Anunnaki's request. That, and the humans knew something was wrong. They could feel it in their souls, and the voice of their conscience echoed an esperate warning of impending doom. The Anunnaki even tried, unsuccessfully, claiming they were the ones who created the humans. However, at that time the Anunnaki were unaware of the connection the humans had to their other subconscious half back on Eden. The Anunnaki were in fact very intelligent creatures however. A series of genetic manipulations performed on the male humans would solve the problem, or so it was believed. One by one the male humans were captured and injected with a DN upgrade that would eventually change the fate of the inhabitants of the Garden of Eden. It would just be a matter of time. The Anunnaki, having completed the genetic tampering, prepared to leave. They needed to give the melting process of the ice-covered planet time to do its thing. A small team was assembled and would remain on Earth to manage and maintain the breeding process of the humans. This task was put into the hands of an op scientist named Denki. Inki was a powerful member of the upper echelon of Anunnaki hierarchy. This covert team would stay hidden and remain secretly among the humans. Inki was very interested in studying the progress on the rate of change in these creatures. 
The Anunnaki had an amazing gift bestowed by the six-headed beast which created them. They had the power to shape-shift, or transform into whatever they needed to be. So they took on human form. Inki stood among the humans and watched as the other Anunnaki boarded their ship and left Earth. At that point the changes to the human mind had not taken over yet. And as the ship left, a legend was born about the ones who came from the sky and black clouds that burned in the sky. And in telling this legend, the first of the changes began to materialize in the hearts and minds of the recently injected men as fear crept in and filled them with a brand new perspective on life. This new emotion clashed heavily with the very limited emotional database humans had been living with up to this point. It only took a few generations of reproduction for Inky to realize something had gone wrong. By this stage there should have been significant changes in the way this creature's mind worked. But the change was minimal at best. These creatures were learning to simply adapt, and somehow they retained the sense of self-worth they had always enjoyed. Frustrated, Inky began a series of experiments on his modified humans. What he discovered shocked and amazed him. In ways he could not understand, it appeared this creature was in fact two creatures. Inky began to decipher a series of files that were part of his spoils of war from the invasion of Eden, and what he learned, he could not believe. These creatures had something called a soul alighted spirit, something he had never heard of, something that made these creatures immortal, another totally new concept to Inky, everlasting life, and he wanted that. In fact, he became obsessed with the idea so obsessed that Inky entirely forgot why he had attempted to change the humans in the first place. All that mattered was finding a way to implant or replicate one of these souls into himself. Experiment after experiment failed, and as these further modified humans got released back among the others, the more damaged the integrity of the humans became. After several more generations, significant changes could be seen so much so that they began to change in their physical appearance over time, not only mentally as the modification was initially supposed to be, the most significant change being the color of some of the creature's skin. There seemed to be several distinct skin tones and physical attributes appearing. Though Inky had yet to discover the secret of the soul, he was forced to return his attention back to creating a workforce for the mining operation. He was rather impressed with one particular group that stood out from the others. It appeared this group was going to be the dominant one. This dominant version of a human had changed almost entirely in color. It began with deep dark brown skin like they all had in the beginning, but now it had transformed to become pale and light colored very much like Kinky himself. Up till this point, Inky and his crew had lived unnoticed among the humans. But it was time for a change. It was now about 190,000 Earth years since the Anunnaki had left in their flying spaceship leaving Inky and his crew behind. Inky and his kind lived to be about 360,000 years old in Earth terms which meant if he was going to complete the actual mission he was here for, he would have to find success soon. His age was creeping up on him. The ice sheets that had once covered the earth had been greatly diminished by this time, and the redistribution of the humans could begin. Inky had sent for the Anunnaki to return. Upon arrival, the first mission was to gather all the humans of each kind based on their skin color. Then. Each race was strategically dispersed around the world to the locations that were no longer inhospitable. There were four distinct traces based solely on skin tone. Dark brown, light brown, yellow, and white. The first three races were relocated in their entirety and kept together. The white race, however, was divided into three groups. See you soon on the next episode.